Up next, it's Mark Lippitt, who's the CEO of Exmos, and uh, interested in hearing what he has to say about the power cost conundrum for TinyML, which is a topic that comes up quite a bit. So thanks, Mark. Over to you. Hi, thanks, Stephen. Um, good evening. Um, I guess good morning and good afternoon are also appropriate for certain members of the audience. Um, so um, I'm talking about the power or cost conundrum for um, TinyML, um, two, two critical vertices in our customers' decision making. And, and uh, perhaps an alternative way of looking at this, um, this question is, is are we as, as semiconductor companies really helping our customers to make the right decisions? Um, I, the first question this person is, what do our customers think Tiny ML is? And if, if we look at um, Peter Warden's book, um, we're talking about tiny machines or microcontrollers. So immediately in our customers' minds, um, we're setting an expectation of low cost. Um, but tiny can also mean many things to many people. Obviously, we talk a lot about power. It's perhaps a less useful metric um, than, than we tend to give it credit for. Uh, more interesting is energy, um, which is useful in thinking about longevity of batteries and ultimately um, how well we're looking after our planet. Um, typically, in tiny ML systems, uh, microcontroller systems, cost is paramount of paramount importance. Um, these systems are typically deeply embedded, um, very, very cost-sensitive applications, and to a lesser extent, perhaps physical size. Um, and when we tend, to, when we talk about these systems. Um, we tend towards simple descriptions, um, simple descriptions that are rooted in the things that, that we as semiconductor companies understand. Um, in order to try and make our, our, our point to our customers, we normalize. We normalize the things that we care about, but, and we do so in isolation. We talk about cost per operation, cost per um, perfor cost, cost and performance, power per operation, maybe even area per operation. But in doing so, in isolation, we end up with a situation where our customer could infer from what we're saying that a $500, 150 watt GPU is what they need, which is everything but um, tiny and, uh, and certainly everything but inexpensive. We really need to talk about absolute numbers and absolute numbers in the context of the applications that our customers are interested in. So we need to talk about dollars, we need to talk about um, joules and, uh, and what that means in terms of hours of operation um, for, um, for for a given battery. Now, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to accept that performance um, is is acceptable. Um, it's a given. It's a, a license to compete, and we're going to talk about power or energy um, and cost. So, power consideration of power starts in silicon. So, obviously, we've talked a little bit about architecture um, today, um, but um, the decisions about power start to be made very very early on in the process. Um, and we typically trade two things. We trade leakage power, which is essentially the tax associated with leaving a device switched on. Um, and we talk about active power, which is the power consumed whilst the device is delivering useful work. Uh, leakage power is, is, is linearly related to, um, to, to, to the uh, core voltage and active power is, is, uh, um, obeys a square law. Um, and so you can see immediately we're in a trade-off um, in duty cycle. Um, so if we've got a device that spends a long time asleep um, in, in a, an inactive state, then um, the integral of the power, the energy that's, that we use in that state is, is, um, is dominated by leakage. If we've got a device that, that, that has to work very, very hard, is active most of the time, then the chances are we'll be thinking more about, about active power. And one observation um, that we've made on these kinds of workloads is they're nothing like what we used to run on microcontrollers. The, 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 um, the lower end microcontrollers, the M series Cortex devices, for example, they will, very, they will really struggle to execute these kinds of workloads. So we're tending towards faster processes with higher operating frequencies. And in order to achieve those higher operating frequencies, we're lowering core voltage um, at the expense of leakage power and we're having to introduce things like power modes to address to address that at an architectural level. But we can also, of course, make decisions about silicon technology. We could choose an exotic process, a more exotic process like silicon insul on insulator. Um, we would be moving um, towards the uh, optimizing power over cost if we were to do that. Or we can stay within bulk CMOS and um, use cheaper, more established technologies, possibly at the expense of power. But in doing so, we're still being very, you know, semiconductor supplier centric. And um, we're looking at a simplification of a system, which is really just the device that we sell. 
If you look at the overall system and you acknowledge the fact that you may need to communicate with other devices, sensors, external memories, and so on, then you have to consider the energy expended in that uh, in that communication. And when we're talking about um, you know signaling voltages and things like that, when we're worrying ourselves with um, noise immunity, we're, we're trying to make sure that um, that the rail voltages stay away from that switching voltage that we might see at transistor level. So we tend to margin quite significantly, um, particularly when we're going across um, PCB traces where we're in a somewhat uncontrolled environment. So in the context of PCBs with um, additional capacitance, with additional inductance as a result of those, um, those traces, we're getting higher noise coupling. So from a power perspective, in order to make sure that we don't have to deal with that high noise scenario, it's a fairly simple rule. We keep things close together and there's nothing closer together than being on the same die as the chip. So integration is really important for many reasons in order for us to deliver a, a system that is capable of executing in low power. And integration, of course, is also, excuse me, I've gone the wrong way. Integration, of course, is also extremely important for, um, for cost. Um, integration allows us to fit fewer components. Um, it, we, uh, we, we talk significantly about AI accelerators. We spent a long time talking about AI as a, as a very sort of specific workload. Um, we mustn't forget that our customers are building applications that use AI, but they don't use AI exclusively. They might have um, IO processing to do uh, in order to talk to various um, subsystems and sensors and so on. They might have control processing to do. They've got communications processing to do and feature extraction, and they need to fit all of those things into a system. So there's typically other, um, there can be other components on the board, um, external memories to fit uh, larger larger models, power supplies and sensors and so on. So it's, it's easy to imagine a situation in which a, a slightly insular view of a great AI component, um, which is inexpensive, can create a bill of materials that is far from inexpensive. So both from a, an intrinsically um, and, and from an interconnect perspective, um, external components are a bad idea. They consume power in and of themselves and they, they consume power in communications across relatively um, lossy uh, mediums. So we want to try and try and integrate. But if we look very, sim very, very quickly at, at the AI side on its own, there's also opportunities within that class of processing to optimize power. Now, first of all, we talked in the last slide about external memory, and um, we can do everything possible to bring that 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 uh, neural network model on chip. Um, we can use um, convolutional neural networks, for example, trading um, and model size parameter um, space for for compute, and that might allow us to fit those parameters on 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 in uh, within the chip. We can change the resolution, or we can we can uh, um, optimize resolution. We can go from 32 to 16 to to 8-bit resolution CNNs. We can even go to um, one-bit resolution to binarize neural networks. And um, hopefully, um, you will have seen a presentation between Exmos and, and Plumerike two days ago, which um, which talked about um, about that subject in in quite some detail. So there's things that we can do. At the, at the sort of architectural level um, and at the system level to try and bring things on chip to reduce the overhead of off-chip communications in terms of power and also cost. If, when we're looking at power, we can also ask ourselves questions about why, when and why we need to inference. Of course, um, we could be inferencing all the time, but actually, if you look at typical applications, you'll see opportunities where it's not no longer necessary. And the question then is, what are you doing under those circumstances? Can you reuse that performance for something else that the application requires? Or can you use that opportunity to go um, to switch into a, a lower power mode? And then as we saw in the previous um, presentation, the questions are how much energy do you require to switch back on? How quickly can you switch back on? Um, do you have to load all the, uh, the parameters? And these are questions that have to be answered with an understanding of the application and the processing that's required. So here's an example, one one that's quite dear to our hearts. Um, of course, you know, keyword uh, spotting is a is a very popular um, edge AI um, workload. Um, first generation smart speakers um, simply listen for for keywords all the time. Um, first generation smart speaker, I won't I won't name it, but it's a real a real example. 
um, it was listening for a keyword um, burning three to four watts. And, and as long as that smart speaker was on, it was burning three or four watts. It didn't matter if there was nobody in the room. It didn't matter if there was nobody in the house. Um, it, it was still sat there listening to a keyword without really understanding the context that it was in. Of course, we can do much better than that. We can use, for example, an envelope detector to detect um, energy within the spectrum of sound that, that could be a voice. We can then switch to a slightly more, uh, a slightly higher power um, voice activity detector that can determine whether it really is a voice. And then we can switch into a keyword detector that can determine whether it's a keyword utterance before we go into mission mode and start burning lots of power. Of course, in making those transitions, we need to be sure that we're not losing critical data in order to make uh, in order that, that would reduce the integrity of the system but in doing so we can make tremendous inroads into the into the power footprint of implementing technologies like keyword spotters a keyword spotter is is event driven it's um you know the first entry point to this uh, to this to this um state diagram if you will is the detection of energy within a certain envelope um you can also imagine um periodic um, challenges. Um, for example, um, on uh, Tuesday, we, we talked about human presence detection, a visual wake word. Now, taking an application level view of that problem, we can observe that humans don't move very fast. Um, we don't need to do a re-evaluation every millisecond or even every 10 milliseconds. We can probably do a re-evaluation every quarter of a second and possibly less frequently than that. So we've got an opportunity to switch the device into a very low power state by interpreting the, the, the requirements of the application and acting upon it in order to deliver a system that our customers would value. So our customers talk systems and, and it's our duty as, as, our, um, as our technology gets more and more complex and becomes more and more applicable to many different um, walks of life, many different applications that we need to talk the language of our customers. Power modes are important. Um, but uh, uh, to be useful, we've got to be capable of making intelligent application layer decisions. And we've got to make sure that we're not compromising the integrity of that application in the time that we take to transition between those power modes. Our customers care about, of course, utility, um, but they care about energy and they care about cost almost above, above all else. And in order to make intelligent decisions on behalf of our customers to simplify the decisions that they have to make, um, we have to um, integrate at a system level. That's a baseline to drive down power and cost. And in a world of tremendously diverse demands, um, we need low power, low cost, adaptable compute. Um, compute which can integrate IO processing, DSP, control, communications, and AI in a flexible platform that is easy to use. And I've avoided the use of uh, uh, referring to our products, but I would love to talk to you about Xcore and how it delivers on that uh, in the breakout room after this talk. Great, right on time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. Great, great, uh, a great session that was. Um, uh, again, just a quick uh, shout out to our sponsors. Bear with me for one minute. We have different categories. We have executive sponsors. First one being ARM. Then we have Qualcomm. We have Samsung. Platinum sponsors, Ada Compute, Lattice Semiconductor, Gold sponsors, Brainchip, Babel Labs, DSP Group. Edge Impulse, Emza, Gray Matter Labs, Green Waves, Hymax, Imagimob. Latent AI, Maxim Integrated,
Quixel, Reality AI, Sensi ML, Silicon Labs, Sentient, Google TensorFlow, XMOS, and lastly, Silver Sponsors, Edge Cortex, Hachi, and Synsense.